In today's show, with round two in the books and the conference finals on tap, we talk lessons from the playoffs. What can the Blazers learn from the teams remaining in the hunt and the teams that just got knocked out? Welcome to Lockdown Blazers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Trailblazers, your daily Portland Trailblazers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, world? It's your past first point guard and Trailblazers reporter, Mike Richmond. You're listening to another episode of Locked On Blazers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, available wherever you get podcasts and also on YouTube. Thanks for making this show your first listen. Coming at you each and every weekday, Monday through Friday. So make it a part of your daily routine. Make your first listen. Tell your friends to do the same. It's Locked On Blazers, your team every day. In today's show, we're talking lessons from the playoffs. Uh, our way of sort of checking in on what is happening in the postseason and uh, tying back the things that we've learned and the teams that have had success and what that can mean for the Blazers' future. Uh, if you're an everyday listener, you know that I love the second round of the playoffs. It's my favorite time of the year. You still get games every single night of the week. Uh, you've kind of... Um, separate the wheat from the chaff. You mostly get good teams. Uh, sometimes you get injured teams, but for the most part, if you win a playoff series in the in the current, particularly in the Western Conference, uh, apologies to Cleveland Cavaliers. Uh, I think uh, for the most part, if you win if you win a playoff series, you're a good team. You get you're down to you're down to eight good teams and it's and it's really good basketball. It's my favorite round of the whole playoffs. I like it better than the conference finals. I like it better than the finals. Not that those games aren't good and all magical and all for all those things, but um, this is the second round is my favorite time of the year. And now it's done. I'm talking to you after the Minnesota Timberwolves went on the road and won in Denver to knock off the champs and head to the conference finals. Uh, the second road team to win a game seven today as the Indiana Pacers rolled over the shorthanded Knicks to make the conference finals as well. So we are down to four teams, Dallas and Minnesota in the West, Boston and Indiana in the East. We are guaranteed a new champion. And for the sixth straight year, this was, this was shared by Kevin Harlan on the TNT broadcast for the sixth straight year, the defending champ failed to reach the conference finals, did not pa get past the second round, uh, not since the Warriors in 20, 2019 as a team that has won the title made it past the uh made it past round two and, and back to the at least the conference finals much less uh, much less to the final round uh so we're guaranteed a new champion and we're continuing this stretch of parity in the league where every year there are new finalists or at least close to it because the uh, the celtics get to the celtics get there every season and disappoint maybe this is the year that they finally won't so uh, with that in mind, with this sort of like, there's a ton of parity in the league. Um, it has never been, we don't have that dominant club right now. Uh, Denver looked like it for portions of the season, but you know, they, they didn't even finish with, 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 you know, the, one of the top records, right. Or, or with the top record in the West. Um, they, they're not that right. And as a proof of it is Minnesota one, uh, the Celtics are really good, but they haven't won a title. So you can't be a dynasty with it. Like, can't be a dynasty by always making the Eastern Conference Finals. Um, it's We don't have that dominant team. We have a fairly wide open field. And thus, the sort of team building, coupled with the sort of lessons from the new CBA, a, the most punitive CBA in league history, um, I, I think we're getting important lessons in team building. So that's what I want to do in today's show is kind of walk you through the teams that are left and the teams that are recently eliminated. What kind of lessons did we learn? Let's start in Minnesota. What a freaking run, right? They they win two in a row in Denver. It seems like they're going to sweep the freaking champs. They lose three straight. Nikola Jokic puts together as good a Game 5 performance as you're ever going to see from an individual. One of the best second halves I've ever seen someone play. And what does Minnesota do? They beat the snot out of them in Game 6, and they come back in Game 7 and come back from a 20-point deficit in the third quarter to in the end, cruise to a win. And what they didn't really get threatened late once uh, Anthony Edwards hit a three with about three minutes left. Ball game, a 30-point second half swing. Um, what is the lesson from Minnesota? And, and I will tie this back into the Blazers at the very end. But I think, um, broadly speaking, I kind of want to just talk about basketball for a little bit. <laughs> but uh, w but I promise this is this this is in the in the the lens of the Portland Trail Blazers as as we go through this. Um, the, the lesson from the, from Minnesota is when you have a chance to acquire top-end talent to pair with your already young top-end talent, do it if. Do it if. And if is the key part for Minnesota, if you can maintain your depth. 
if you can maintain your depth. Because I think we've seen it in other places where teams have tried to um, acquire Kevin Durant and build super teams. And you and those those teams, those type of roster builds, have not had enough depth to be good. I think the Suns are, you know, they, they were pretty, they had a pretty good regular season record despite their health, but they just got exposed because they they don't they didn't have enough depth. They didn't have enough enough talented players to match up against a team that is as good as the Wolves. Obviously, like the Wolves are like championship level good, and so the Suns kind of getting rolled by them in the first round of the playoffs. Maybe it looks a little bit better, but like when you're making the big swings, when you're acquiring the high-end talent, do it. The lesson for Minnesota is do it if. If you can maintain your depth. If you don't have to sell all off all of your prospects to do it. Obviously, Minnesota is like going to be light on draft picks. Um, they're going to have to really nail some because they, they either owe picks or owe swaps. Like, they have to nail some of some of the probably won't be swapping, but uh, nail some of their own late draft picks like that. That's that's their path forward. Um, they're going to be a really expensive roster, so it's going to be hard to, you know, hard to hard to make moves in the new new CBA. But like the lesson is go for it. When they went for it last season, they make this Rudy Gobert trade and they struggled. And it seemed like the worst trade in NBA history. Some people were calling it in, in certain circles and they come back this year and they're awesome. And Anthony Edwards takes a huge step forward and they're excellent. And they're excellent because of Rudy Gobert. I, I, I want to be, I want to be clear about that. Ant drives the bus Ant Edwards drives the bus. He's, he's their best player and, 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 and the engine of that team. But the reason that they're so good is because of the best defensive team in the league. And the reason that they're the best defensive team in the league is because Rudy Gobert holds it down. And he got punked in game five. The MVP gave it to him in a way that he just couldn't hang, right? Like he couldn't hang. It was like, well, I'm giving up buckets to one of the best players ever and I've got no shots. And I'm supposedly one of the best defensive players of all time and I got no shot. I thought Rudy Gobert was great in game six. I thought he was great in game six. I thought he was darn good in game seven. Not as good as, 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 as dominant as he was uh, in game six, but he was darn good in game seven. Darn good in game seven. They won the game. They won as many games as they did the regular season because of their elite defense. And then you have this elite defense and you allow Anthony Edwards to be to drive the ship. He wasn't very good in Game 7, like, efficiency-wise. He did um, get a ton of attention and his attention opened up everything and allowed them to go get offensive rebounds and all those things, like... I'll, I'll throw out the stats a little bit in the Game 7. You just try to win the game. Um, and he his impact, Anthony Edwards' impact, was obvious. But... The lesson from Minnesota, and and when the if the Blazers should they get there right because they're a lot of steps away, is that when you are a team like Minnesota is a good example, right, um, where you're not going to be a big factor in free agency. Like the biggest free agent that's on the roster is um, is is Kyle Anderson, right? It's like someone who's who's maybe not going to play a ton in certain matchups. Um, you know, they, they mostly have drafted players, players the players they've drafted and players they've acquired via trade. Conley and Conley and and Gobert. You, if you have an opportunity to acquire top end talent without giving up your depth, you do it because your depth is going to win you the game. Nas Reed coming in the game in the last six minutes won them the game, but they get there because they're so good with with the group they have. That's the lesson from Minnesota. I want to talk about the lesson from the Indiana Pacers, and I want to use a word that people don't like. I want to talk about luck because luck is a factor, and it's always a factor, and it's a factor for the really good teams as it is for the okay teams. And the way you get lucky is you make sure you have an opportunity. Let's talk about the opportunity that the Pacers created for themselves and the good luck, the good fortune they found themselves having. This we'll do in the second segment. Lessons from the playoffs as we roll on heading to the Midwest. Actually, I guess further east into the Midwest. Join me in that second segment, won't you? First, though, I want to tell you that today's show is brought to you by Yahoo Finance. Wouldn't you like to see all of your investments all in one place. Wouldn't it be great if you could see your investment accounts and your retirement accounts in one single spot with Yahoo Finance. You can consolidate your views from multiple accounts into one hub and access expert analysis you need to tend to your entire portfolio with confidence. So if you got a 401k and you got an investment account with a Roth IRA somewhere, you're going to see it all right there with the tools that Yahoo Finance provides. For more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor. Whether you're a seasoned investor or looking for extra guidance, Yahoo Finance gives you all the tools and data you need in one place. The number one finance destination, producing a holistic look at, fi at the financial news cycle, including breaking news, original editorial perspectives, analyst ratings, independent research, customizable charts, and so much more. 
securely link your brokerage accounts for a unified view of your wealth, including that 401k and other investments. Like I said, a comprehensive perspective is what sets you apart as a great investor. It's how Yahoo Finance ensures you have the insight to look at your wealth in its entirety for comprehensive financial news and analysis with the brand behind every great investor, yahoofinance.com, the number one financial destination. That's yahoofinance.com. One more time for you, yahoofinance.com. Today's show is also brought to you by Prize Picks. It is the most popular fantasy sports app anywhere. It's number one with 3 million members. It's the easiest, most exciting way to get in on daily fantasy action. While you're watching your favorite sports and your favorite players, you just pick more or less on two or more player stats, and then you can watch the winnings roll in right now on prize picks. During the NHL playoffs and the NBA playoffs, you can win 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks. That's turning 10 bucks into $1,000 with basketball and hockey picks all postseason long. Get your entries today on prize picks. It's America's number one fantasy sports app. What you got to do is download the app and use the code LOCKEDONNBA for a first deposit match up to $100. They're matching you dollar for dollar up to 100 bucks on your first deposit, but you got to use that promo code LOCKEDONNBA when you download the app. That's prize picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, let's keep it rolling. Lessons from the Indiana Pacers. Here's a lesson from the Indiana Pacers. Make sure you have the opportunity to get lucky. The only way the Indiana Pacers had the opportunity to get lucky is because they decided in January to make a big swing for Pascal Siakam. Siakam was awesome. In the second round of the playoffs, he was so stinking good. He was great. He was uh, he was great. Um, um, you know, he's a he's a champion. He's an all he's an all NBA guy, former all NBA guy. Like he's 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 really good, and he played like it. And the reason that you trade for someone of, of Siakam's caliber was fully on display in round two, and fully on display in in Madison Square Garden in Game Seven. He was great. He was great. But you can't deny that the Pacers didn't get lucky. In round one, they you know they they're a, they're the sixth seed, right? So they 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 did what they needed to do to avoid the play-in. Incredibly important. The regular season is still rewards you for being good, right? Because if you fall down in that um, seven through ten range, you're in the play-in. You got to you know you're gonna have to play one, if not multiple, single elimination games. Then you're gonna play a top seed. Like it's just your path is gonna be really hard. If you get one of the top six seeds, you get rewarded. Um, you know either home court advantage or or, 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 or or a slightly less strenuous path. And for the Pacers, they got a Bucks team that um, they had played well against during the regular season, but like all those were like pre-Christmas games. I don't know if they mattered. Uh, but yeah, outside of Takubo got hurt. Damian Lord got hurt. They beat, a, they beat a Bucks team that was shorthanded and you don't apologize. You keep it moving and you head on to the next round. Then they face the Knicks. And the Knicks looked awesome against the against the Sixers, but they just couldn't stay healthy. They lose Mitchell Robinson. They lose OG Ananobi. Josh Hart was banged up. Isaiah Hartenstein was banked up. Um, at, at the end of the series, uh, well, Jalen Brunson was playing hurt, and at the end of the series, he breaks his hand, fractures a hand, bone in his hand in Game 7. Like, Pacers were rolling. They were dominating Game 7. They were, they were um, you know, they, they bounced back from getting punked in Game 5 to win handily in Game 6 and then win a game on the road. Um, you do, you do that because you are good, right? And you play well and like you can say like, I, I, one thing I've noticed or I've learned, I don't know I've noticed, I've learned um, doing this podcast, doing d- talking to a microphone for however many years I've been doing it, f- f- four and some change. Um, like people, the fans don't like luck. They don't like the word luck because luck implies that putting Aaron Neesmith on Jalen Brunson didn't change the series. Luck implies that Tyrese Halliburton being more aggressive and the Pacers cutting down their playoffs didn't win the series. Luck implies that uh, Pascal Siakam realizing that he just had space to operate in the mid range. And if he went to his office and shot over guys who were smaller because they didn't have an, uh, they didn't have a, someone to guard him and he could get his jumper off. That, that implies like that, that the strategical tweaks and the good play of players on the team didn't have, weren't a factor. And I, I, I that's not what I mean. What I mean is when you are building a team and you are trying to give yourself an opportunity, right? Like, I don't think the Pacers at any point in the season probably said, we can win a title. Like, maybe the players did and some people there, but like, I don't even think like the people that build the Pacers roster were like sitting around like, we can win the championship. Watch how we do it. Uh, I just don't believe that. But they knew that like, we're better today by adding Pascal Siakam. We're closer. Uh, we 
Tyrese Halliburton is too good of a player to pass on an opportunity to get a good player. This is the sort of the, the same lesson, but um, instead of uh, they didn't make this leap into like elite territory like the T-Wolves did. They stayed like, okay, we're a solid team. We're probably a, a year and I'm a couple moves away, but they gave themselves the opportunity by being good, by being talented enough and then when the opportunity, like by being talented enough, they got themselves in the playoffs. They put themselves in a position. And then when things broke their way, they took advantage of it. Um, I, I think there is a certain fan and, I, and certain media type of media people. And I, I think this is a, like a fine opinion to hold, but I don't hold it. That if you're not like in that championship inner circle, that you're not good enough. And as the season is like, you know, the, the goal, ultimate goal is a title. And if you fall short of that, you, you are in some ways a failure. I don't believe that. I believe there's a lot of ways to have successful seasons. And I think that the Pacers are, I don't think they're going to win a title. I don't think they're going to make the champ, make the finals. I think they're going to lose the Celtics. This, but they certainly could win because they put themselves in the position. And when you get in the series, you have an opportunity to. But if they don't, the things they did and the steps they did to get here and learn the lessons they did to get here are invaluable. They're invaluable. And you can have a successful season in my eyes and come up short. I think it should be celebrated making conference finals. Like it's really hard to win a couple playoff series in the NBA. Winning two is the mark of good teams. You can't fake the funk at this point. You can get lucky. You can, you can be, you can seize an opportunity that was in front of you, but um, you can't fake the funk. Like the, the Pacers are, are, are good enough and scrappy enough that I think they'll give, I would be, I wouldn't be surprised if they win a couple games off, off the Celtics. I wouldn't be surprised if it went to seven based on the way Boston's playing. Um, but Boston's really talented. I, I would be worried about them. <laughs> Speaking of Boston, I think the lesson from from really good teams is hard to like apply back to the Blazers. Like for the Blazers, like the Minnesota thing is like simple, right? It's like if you draft a star like Anthony Ed Anthony Edwards, which you hope to do, either you hope that that player's already magically on the roster, or you hope to do in the next couple drafts. If you draft a player that good, take the opportunities when you can. For the Pacers, it's like if you have that player on the team, when if you acquire Tyrese Halliburton. Um, via a player you traded or the player you drafted in Paul George, if you believe in the transitive properties of trades, I don't think that's exactly how it works. But um, like if you have good young players, take the opportunities to improve. And even if you don't think you get yourself into the, the, the winner's circle, you know, like, a, or like the contenders, inner circle of contenders, get yourself an opportunity, punch your chance. You might make the conference finals and have a really rewarding and, and, and valuable season for the Celtics. It's like, they made the finals in 2022. They made the Eastern Conference Finals a year ago. It's like their 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 lesson is not as clean for the Blazers because it's like seven years ago in back to back drafts, drafts like two of the top 25 players in the NBA, and then just like march forward forever with those two players, right? Like that is maybe the lesson, right? But the lesson, like in the sort of more immediate time for the Celtics, is no matter how how good you are, you have to keep taking risks if you don't get there. And the Celtics took risks. I think trading Marcus Smart, um, in, in some ways, is risky just on from a cultural standpoint, right? Like it, like he had he's like a he had a real um, presence about him, even if he was a little bit chaotic. But you trade Marcus Smart, you trade Malcolm Brogdon, the sixth man of the year, you trade Time Lord, uh, Rob Williams to add Drew Holiday and add Chris, Chris Tapps Porzingis and you're the most talented roster in the league. Like, like, even if you have been to the finals and been to the Eastern Conference, Eastern Conference finals and been as good as they've been consistently, um, you have to keep improving and taking risks because your window with any certain core is always shorter than you think. Like, whatever, whatever you think, like, okay, and I, th I think this is a lesson for OKC. I'll mention this in a second. It's like, if you think like, okay, we've got, we're good enough that we have a five to seven year window, cut it in half. You have a two and a half to three and a half year window. Like, right? Like you have four seasons at the most because it's, things are going to change. People are going to get hurt. Money's going to come up. Another team is going to send. Like, it's just, you never, you always have to go for it. And the Celtics, because they've been so close and like, you know, they've, they've, a little got a little Icarus in them. They have gotten pretty close to the sun and had their wings melt, uh, particularly when when Steph Curry burned them down. Like it's you got to keep you have to keep tweaking, and that means you have to take risks. And even though adding talent is is always good, right? Drew Holiday's really good. Chris Tapps Porzingis is darn good. Like even though that that's uh, like the path, it's not always that simple, right? Like. Um, it has an inherent risk. It has an, it, changing up a core has an inherent risk. But I think this, the lessons from the Celtics, albeit further down the road, is like continue to take those risks. I want to talk Mavs. I want to talk OKC and a little bit of Denver. And then I want to talk about identity, team identity as it belongs to the Blazers, as it applies to the Blazers. Excuse me. That's what we'll do to close the show. Join me in that third segment, won't you?
But first, I want to tell you that today's show is brought to you by FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And it is winner take all time in the NBA and in the NHL. And FanDuel is giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. Go to FanDuel. Put five dollars down on something. You win. You get your you get your bet right. They're gonna give you one hundred and fifty bucks to bet on whatever you're looking at. So spreads, money lines, player props, and more. Visit FanDuel.com/lockedon and make every playoff shot count. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Still a pass, first point guard. I'm still Mike Richman. You are still listening to Locked on Blazers. Let's talk lessons. I think the Mavs are um, one of the best sort of lessons for a team building um, exercise that that exists in these playoffs right now. Uh, the Celtics are up there because they just built such a good team. But it's like the Mavs are... They have the market inefficiency on what it takes, what has recently and recent seasons has, has taken to win a championship. And I think if the Celtics win, um, or if or if Minnesota wins, maybe the ascension of Edwards will, will knock this out. But like for the most part, what you need is one of the five best players in the world, and maybe one of the three best players in the world. And the Mavs have that. And when you have that, you can win a title. It's just you can't do that if you don't have the right team around that top five, top three player. I don't know what Luke is, top five, top three. He's one of the best players in the league, without a doubt. He's a force in and of himself. He's terrifying for defenses. He makes teams make tough decisions every time he touches the ball. Um, you know, there's some complaints about his style and it not working or whatever, but sure has been working. And the reason it has been working is because the Mavs built an excellent defense around him. Excellent defense around him. They were the most aggressive team at the trade deadline. Um, and the lesson for the Mavs is not about maintaining your depth it's not about um you know making sure you're in line to take advantage of opportunities when they when they present themselves a la this year's pacers and the 2019 blazers it's never waste a season of the guy when you have the guy never waste a season never waste a season of the guy last year they wasted a season of, of luka Doncic's career they wasted a season of them because they weren't good they took the kyrie irving swing and they just weren't good enough they were too small on the wings and even the wings they had that with were size weren't dynamic enough they weren't big enough in the middle you know it's just too much dwight powell too much too much on maxi Klebus plate who's a good player but just like you can't it can't be every the answer to every question can't be maxi Kleba. It's got it like he was hurt in this this series, and they won anyways. I'm a big Maxi Kleba believer. I think he's an excellent defender, really good role player. But like the answer to every question, if every question is who's going to guard him, who's going to be our size, it's like if every answer is Maxi Kleba, your team's not good enough. And the Mavs did not stand pat at this at this deadline. They were a pretty good team. Like they're going to make the playoffs regardless because Luke was really good and Kyrie's Kyrie's really good, and they 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 were kind of had an up and down year. But then when when they but, but they were at times like, you know, right in the mix. And I think they were probably going to be a top six ish team or right on the cusp. Um, but they were, they were going to be talented, but they weren't good enough. They weren't good enough to win multiple playoff series prior to the trade deadline. And then they went out and made, they were the most aggressive team, most aggressive, good team at the trade deadline, most aggressive, good team in the trade deadline. You get PJ Washington, you get Daniel Gafford, you, you know, you move around assets to make those trades work. Now they play 48 minutes with a big rim protecting center all the time. They have big wings with PJ Washington and Derek Jones Jr. So they don't ever play basically, they don't play basically anyone who's ever at Kyrie Irving's height or smaller. With Lucas so freaking big, you play big wings who can attack a little bit off the catch. They're not elite play, like playmakers or creators, but when you have Luka and Kyrie, you have an identity. What you need is guys that are complementary to that identity. Our identity is we have two of the best shot makers and shot creators in the league. Luka is a heliocentric monster, and Kyrie Irving is one of the best, most creative scorers in the history of the NBA. And what we need around them is shooters, defenders, and guys who can attack a closeout. Derek Jones Jr. has played the best basketball of his career in Dallas. PJ has been really good in the playoffs for, for the Mavs. And the center thing with Daniel Gafford and Derek Lively really works. And one of the reasons that I you got to look at the Mavs is because they traded up in the draft to get Derek Lively. Know what you need. Know your identity. We need size. 
We need defenders. We need shooters. And go get it. We need a rim-rolling defensive center. Who's that in our draft range? Who can we reasonably trade up and get? It's Derek Lively. Go get him. He's been, he was f freaking great in this playoff round. Great. Great. Dominated a team like in OKC. Which brings me a little bit to OKC here. So, like, the lesson from... The lesson from the Mavs is once you, like, the thing you need to have a chance is one of the five best players in the league. Never waste it. Be aggressive in, in doing so. And that doesn't need to be huge swings, right? They took their huge swing with Kyrie Irving, right? And, and, and eventually that worked and that pairing has been good. But, like, what they did this year was they didn't say, hey, we have a, we have a really good top-end talent. They said, our role players need to make sense. Their team is awesome on defense because their role players make sense. They just don't let you score at the rim. You have to beat them by knocking down shots, and they fly around. They clog the paint, and they fly around and don't give up super super easy looks from three. Um, they, they dare bad shooters to shoot, and they close out hard, and they do not let anyone score at the rim. They're a freaking great defensive team right now. They're playing incredible, and they've been playing great defense since the trade. Since the trade deadline, they've been one of the best defenses in, in the league. They, they, they knew what their identity had to be, and they went and built it. OKC is perhaps the reverse of the Mavs. They were really good this year. Their identity was defined. They're a five-out team built around guys on the perimeter who can shoot and make plays. But specifically, they want to be five-out because their best player, Shea Gildas Alexander, likes to dribble and take mid-range jumpers. So you need he needs that space, right? He needs the other four guys at the perimeter for the most part to give him that space. But uh, a friend of mine, uh, the day of the trade deadline, texted me and said that the OKC is going to regret not getting a big. Like, they're going to regret it. They're going to regret it. And what do they do in this playoffs? I, I, I think they regretted not being big enough. When you are... When you're as good as they were, there is some risk in adding, in tweaking things, right? And making like a big splash. I don't think they necessarily needed to make a big splash, right? Because you don't want to mess up the chemistry. I kind of I talked about that earlier, like um, with, with the Celtics. You don't want like a really good team. So there's, there is a, a subtle balance of, of the chemistry. And particularly OKC, they're young. They're ascending. This is like their first year of being elite. First year of being in the playoffs. And they're freaking the number, number one seed. But like you look at the West and you say... Okay, well, to win, to do what we want to do this year, we have to beat either Denver or Minnesota uh, to get there, right? They didn't have to deal with any of them. They just couldn't hang with Derek Lively and Daniel Gafford. They couldn't hang with that size. Like, Chet Holmgren is a really good player. I think he's excellent and he's going to be good for a long time. He just They needed more size. In the, at the end of Game 6, the game that they lost to close the series, they played... They played Chet next to Jalen Williams. Uh, that's Jalen Williams, Arkansas, the other big guy, because they desperately needed more size. This was a team that didn't need to make a big swing, but they needed they needed to address a specific weakness, which is they just weren't big enough along the front line. Adding Bismack Biombo for insurance is not the solution that wins you a title. But like, is Kelly Olynyk? Even is like Xavier Tillman, who ended up going to the Celtics, is is like just a a bigger body who can defend. Is that is that a better option? Um, you know, it, it's hard to say like they, sh they should have been the team to get Daniel Gafford, but like maybe they should, <laughs> maybe they should have been the team to get Daniel Gafford. Like maybe they certainly they could have facilitated it with the assets they have, um, could, could, could have made the move. But I even think like, lo like a, even a lower level, like a, a Tillman or a, a Kelly Olenek's probably the same ish level as Gafford, but like even a Xavier Tillman level edition, where it's just like, how about a big body that can play in the playoffs, doesn't need to play every night, but can play in the playoffs if we need to go big, if we need another, if we need more size, eventually the size beat, beat them up. I think OKC is going to be fine, but under my, like, my reasoning, whatever you think your play, whatever you think your contention window is, cut it in half. I would be worried about, not worried. I would star the idea that this was a season when you knew you had a weakness and they chose not to address it. Obviously, there's drawbacks with with all those things. Like, and and, and maybe you know, without a t without every player on the floor being able to shoot threes and make plays a little, make you know, drive and kick. Right, that's their whole offense. Uh, and like with with having a guy who can't do that, maybe that takes a lot away of what you do. But they lost because they weren't big enough. Right, they, they like they should have lost in five. They stole a game. Right, Dallas dominated them. They were way better than OKC in the series. Um, I think that's an interesting interesting lesson in team building. And it's about knowing your identity because I think in some ways um, OKC didn't didn't make a change because they didn't want to dis disrupt their identity, and Dallas made changes because they specifically saw what their identity had to be. Um, Denver, I want to mention them briefly. Like they're just they just didn't have enough depth. They're, when they won a championship, they got big minutes off the bench from uh, from Bruce Brown and from from uh, from Jeff Green, and then they had Christian Brown play a little bit in the, in the finals. Like. 
but in game seven, uh, the non-Jokic, non-Jamal Murray Nuggets made eight shots, eight field goals. It's not enough. Uh, what you can't do, and, and they're going to have some challenges, is you can't, their starting five is like a perfect match. Hard to win a league against without depth. They could have won. They were up 20 in, in the second half of Game 7. They absolutely could be in the conference finals right now. So I don't say like, I don't mean to say like they screwed it up, but you you knew what the, the identity was that they had seven darn good playoff guys and they and they knocked it down to like five and a half. Christian Brown's fine, but five and a half. Uh, I'll give Brown a half playoff guy. Like, I, can, can you win with five playoff guys? Like, can, if at some point you the the nuggets are really good they're going to be right back here again because they're really good but they have to you know um they know what their identity is and they'll continue to do it but they have to add depth for more guys that fit their identity so i've used that word a lot the i word identity and i want to talk about this specifically in in relation to the blazers because i think the lessons are clear take risks if you if you can maintain your depth be opportunistic because there's if you can upgrade your team, there's no reason to say, hey, we're not a championship level team. Let's not upgrade. Um, always, always looking to improve, like like Boston and if and for and for and for Dallas, the, the other team in in the final in the, the conference final series. Like once you understand your identity, go go out and get the players that fit it. But here's the thing: I think talent has to define identity. Um, there is, you know, I think the Blazers have types of players they like they like longer physical wings right and that seems to be a, a, a prototype that fits for a lot of guys Blazers haven't found a guy like two-way wings yet guys who can play offense and defense but they seem to have a lot of like defensive minded tough wings that seems to be a thing that they they've kind of prioritized over the last 15 months in adding or so or two years i guess if you count jabari walker as well and you should um but they can't start to build their identity until they have a guy and they don't have that right now if it's Shane Sharp, if it's Scoot Henderson, if it's still Amphrey Simons, whatever it might be, um, and I, I, I don't think it's like capable of that talent-wise to build around. Um, and Scoot and Shane Sharp certainly aren't there now, but, but they are younger, so certainly grow in. Believably, they could grow into it. But it could be someone you draft this year. It could be someone you draft in twenty twenty-five. You can't just you can't determine your identity until you have a what your 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 best player, your most talented player determines your identity. The Pacers play incredibly fast and wide open because Tyrese Halliburton lets them do what they do, right? Uh, the Mavs play with size and shooters around Luka Doncic with, you know, defenders that can really clog up the paint and be big, and that's their strength on defense, right? And they don't have a lot of other dudes who need to dribble and, and create off the... They have two guys who dribble and create, right? Because they have elite creators. They know their identity. Minnesota play giant at all times. The reason they won the game at the end of the game is because they put another big guy in, and he and Nasri crushed the the um, the the Nuggets down the stretch. Freaking blocking Jokic shots, making drives, uh, swooping jelly drives, and um, dunking home misses. Like the, they they play to an identity. The Blazers need to establish an identity, but you establish an identity with talent. I think you can have a type of player you like and you can have a style you'd like to play, but you don't establish your identity until you have that player. And that's the step for the Blazers. Before they get to all these steps and all these lessons, that talent has to be there, that talent base. They need top-end talent. They don't have it yet. And when they get it, they can start to apply these lessons to what they want to be. Then the next step for them is just to add a player that can define their identity. And then you take these lessons and... You know, know, learn what you've learned watching the good teams and try to avoid their mistakes, avoid their pitfalls and follow and follow the path um, as best you can once your identity is established of, of being of what the what the successful teams have done. Try to try to copy that blueprint. That's going to do it for today's show. Um, thanks for rocking with me and let me talk a little hoops. Um, second round RIP. I love you. Conference finals, you're cool too. Uh, we'll watch those games as well. Mortar shows this week. It's what we do five days a week wherever you get podcasts and also on YouTube. Tell your friends about the program. I appreciate you listening. I'll talk to you soon.